All right, and joining me now via Zoom, uh, very excited to have this gentleman on the show, former UConn Husky All-American, 14-year uh, NBA vet, and the current head coach of the Central Connecticut State Blue Devils, uh, hop, skip, and a jump from where I grew up in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. Coach, how you doing today? Danielle Marshall on the phone. How you doing? Doing good, doing good. How are you? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. And, you know, you and I have been trading texts, trying to do this for a while. Uh, first of all, I would just ask, I mean, uh, you know, obviously everybody is in a little bit of a different boat right now in terms of where we're at. But, uh, you know, how are you holding up, your family holding up, and, of course, your, your program and players? I mean, I know for coaches across the country, it's been a spring and summer kind of unlike anything you guys have ever dealt with. Uh, Central Connecticut Blue Devils holding up all right? Um, we've actually been holding up pretty well. We've gotten lucky that, you know, most of our team had stayed in pack, um, you know, so we didn't really have any transfers. We had two, but, um, you know, we were pretty much prepared for that. Um, we were able to get commitments right away. Um, so we were able to fill that part of the team up right away where we were at full roster, you know, within a month after the pandemic and everything hit and shut everything down. So we weren't scrambling necessarily to find players. Um, you know, because we got that done ASAP, um, which was really good because then we were able to, as coaches, stay on top of our players, um, you know, and help them get their grades right for this semester. It was a very difficult time. Um, you know, even some of the kids who were, you know, 4.0 students and whatever were having trouble, um, you know, learning this way. A lot of them like to be able to talk to the teachers after class and things like that. It was difficult. But um, honestly, we've had our best semester since I've been here. We had a 3.0 this semester. Um, so, so that was pretty good. Um, myself, I've been able to work out uh, a little bit more, really, you know, not really much to do at home. So, uh, you know, going for runs, uh, ride my Peloton, um, been able to, I was able to get some weights just in time before nice. everything sold out. Um, okay. So I was able to get that stuff and able to continuously do CrossFit. Um, I kind of got suckered. I went to Lowe's one day looking for a cord for my old smoker. Um, okay. but for years I wanted a pellet smoker. So it, it, it must've just been on sale that day. I walked in for a cord from my old smoker, walked out with a new smoker. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and you know, ever since then I've been smoking meats, uh, for the last couple of weeks, been ribs, chicken, uh, Best brisket I've actually done um, nice. ever. So um, just been doing things like that. Um, doing Zoom calls with the players. Uh, we did a couple of Zoom calls with um, a couple NBA people just to talk to the players and tell them how it is and how hard they needed to work and things like that. So just to keep their interest. But that was, I did a couple of speaking engagements on Zoom. Um, you know, so pretty much what I've been doing the last couple of months. So it sounds like, you know, you've gotten to spend a lot of quality time around the house. You know, one thing talking to people in your business across the country, have you enjoyed downtime with the family, more time at home, like you said, using the, 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 the grill or doing stuff like that? Because it seems like you've been productive, uh, you know, finding the new norm and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, you know, probably a little different for me. I live at home alone. Um, okay. So... You know, at times I did find myself talking to myself. Uh, you know, I think that's why I was very okay with doing a lot of Zoom calls and things sure. like that, just to see people and talk to people. Um, so, but for me, um, been going through a lot the last couple of years, uh, personally and, and mentally. So for me, it was a good time to be able to find some things about myself, um, help myself become, you know, get into a better place um, in life and everything like that. So. Um, you know, for some people, the pandemic was probably something that they didn't want, that they didn't need. But I think for me, it really helped me out um, a lot personally. Fantastic. You know, one thing I do want to get into your playing career, very decorated playing career. Like I said, you were the first All-American at UConn in a 14-year NBA career that included, a, you know, some time with LeBron James in Cleveland, uh, lottery pick of the Minnesota Timberwolves, et cetera. But, you know, one thing that I noticed, so I saw that you at Central Connecticut, you and your staff and really the entire uh, athletic department are in the middle of kind of a fundraising drive right now. And you uh, on Twitter this afternoon, or, you know, we're recording here on Tuesday, but uh, you know, on your Twitter feed at dmarsh 42, you know, you're saying, Hey, help out the central Connecticut state blue devils. And it could be 
um, you know, big donation, obviously, but also a small donation for little things like <laughs> training equipment, foam rollers, things like that. And I thought it would be interesting because, you know, it's easy for someone like myself who covers this sport to focus on the Kentuckys or the Dukes or the Kansases or whatever. But, you know, you guys are doing something different. You guys are playing the same game, but almost a completely different game, um, you know, at the small and low major level. And so I wanted you to tell, talk a little bit about the fundraising, but also just the unique challenges that come with coaching at the low major level that, again, maybe the UConn fan, the Kentucky fan, the Kansas fan might not be fully aware of. Um, well, first off, you're going to mess my pension up. Keep saying 14 years. It was 15 years. Don't, don't, I'm don't, sorry, don't Coach. Don't mess me up. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. But <laughs> math was never um, I went, Math was never my strong suit, so I apologize. <laughs> no, nah, it's all right. I like to get people mess it up all the time. I get 17 years, 12 years, 13. It doesn't, you know, it's all funny games. But, um, you know, I think you hit it on, hit the nail on the coffin. It, uh, on the head, you know, it's, a lot of people don't understand, they just look at it and say, oh, it's Division One," And they don't realize the difference of, you know, we're 30, 40 minutes away from UConn and, and, and our budgets and the difference of donations that they get compared to what we get. Um, and, you know, just the difference of eating and, and, and travel is, is, is way different. Um, you know, for us, we're we're looking for donations. Like you said, we're doing a double dare. And what it is is right now for the next couple of days, um, it's in, the, the, the school will match um, anywhere from $25 to $500. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they will match it. And it's up until, I think it's like 80000 Once the 80000 is gone, it's gone. Um, so we try to get on it right away because all the team, all the, uh, all the, 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 the teams are doing it. Um, and actually the school is doing it too. So it's, you, you, you're fighting with, you know, 17 other sports and, and the school. So, you try to get as many people to, uh, to donate as quickly as possible so that you can get as much as possible. Um, you know, and this is pretty much how we survive. Um, you know, like you said, we get, this is how we get our foam rollers. This is how we get our uniforms. Um, this is how we get our sneakers, um, you know, and, and things like that. This is how we're able to, when we go on the road, you know, feed the kids a little bit better, um, you know, travel a little bit better, um, things like that. And, you know, every little thing helps, you know. Um, we, we haven't had um, a lot of pros to be able to give back to our um, program, you know, where we can when do things like that, where we can just call up, you know, Ray Allen or whoever and say, you know, can you donate $100,000 or can you donate whatever? And we don't, we don't have that. Um, so we have to, you know, the, the fans help us out. Um, and it, it's something that's been going on for years. It, it's a very good thing. Um, you know, we usually get a lot of supporters at this point in time. And they really understand um, what it's about and stuff. And, um, you know, but that's how we survive and that's how we keep going. And, and it, it's good. It helps bring us closer to the fans. And it really lets the fans understand, like, you know, hey, I helped them out a little bit. I helped with those uniforms. or I helped with the basketball. I helped with this and helped with that. So it, it's something that's good and it's really fun to do at this time of year. And, you, again, the Twitter feed is uh, at DMarsh42, I believe. And so – Everything donated goes directly to the program. Um, like you said, foam rollers, basketballs, the little <laughs> things that I think a lot of people take for granted. I mean, I, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but you've obviously, look, you played at UConn, you, you've traveled to these uh, Power Five programs and things like that. Um, how different is your life? How different, you know, and it's, it's well-documented <laughs> college basketball. A lot of programs spent all in November, December on the road. I looked it up. Uh, seven of your first 11 were away from home in New Britain this past season. Um, anything else about that gap? Because again, I just, I, I just, I, I don't mean to belabor the point. As I said, I don't think the average fan understands the difference between what a power five blue blood program might go through and somebody kind of uh, in the NEC like you guys, uh, it's a much smaller scale. Well, I mean, you look at the small things where, you know, we, you know, UConn goes plays Ohio State. UConn will fly to Ohio State, um, you know, where we went and played Cleveland State uh, a couple of years ago and we drove to Cleveland wow. State, you know, so it's like things like that, you know, Robert Morris, when we go to Robert Morris, that's a nine hour bus ride. We take the bus to Robert Morris, um, sure. you know, where UConn, where they would play Pitt, they're flying to Pitt. Um, now, with that being said, I enjoy being on the bus. You know, I think we, 
we we build a lot of memories. Um, the movies we watch, to, you know, especially after wins, you know, we celebrate on the bus and we have fun and things like that. I think it brings us closer together. Um, but, you know, people don't understand is that that can be, you know, tiring sometimes, though. Um, you know, taking a, a long bus and then having to come back and go to class the next day and and things like that, that takes a toll on your body. But, you know, what? It, it, it's something that we, we fight for, we live for. You know, a lot of people will sit up here and say, well, they go to school for free. You know, they should be able to this and that, whatever. But, you know, it is. They do go to school for free. But you also have to realize is when, when somebody's getting their tail beat, you know, whatever, sometimes you have to take in those factors of what the travel schedule is like, what the travel is like, what it's not like, um, you know, the different tolls on the kids and, you know, coming back and, you know, sleeping on the bus, you know, sometimes, like I said, we're, we're getting back or we're getting somewhere at two, three o'clock in the morning and, you know, you're trying to go to the bathroom on the bus and <laughs> the kids are sleeping all on the floor of the bus and you're trying to navigate to the back of the bus to go to the sure. bathroom, you know, it, it's, 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 it's things like that. But again, like I said, it, it's, for me, it's something that has helped us out a lot. Um, for me, when I had my AAU program before I started coaching, that's the way we traveled. So I was used to it before we even got to this level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of people said, oh, NBA, it was, this was this travel, this whatever. But in the summer times, I had an AAU program, and this is how we traveled. So I was I was way used to it. And for me, I, I like to drive. So I, I, I drive <laughs> a lot in the summertime. You know, I, I, if I got somewhere five hours, I'm, I have no problem jumping in the car and drive. And I, I do a lot of thinking during that time. Um, so for me, it, it's really nothing. Fantastic. Uh, anything else on where you guys are at? You're obviously, I believe, entering year five at Central. Uh, NEC is a traditional one-bid league, and I, I, it sounds like you've been in good touch with your players since the season ended. It seems like there's some good continuity going into the 2020-21 season. Anything about the program and everything that we haven't hit on? Um, no, I think that, you know, this is going to be a very difficult year for everybody. Um, it's going to be a different norm, as you said. So, it's going to be very hard <laughs> to predict who's going to be able to win conferences, how good teams are going to be. You know, some schools are going to be able to open up earlier than others because of their states, because of the school, um, things like that. Um, you know, we still don't even know what games we're going to be allowed to play, how we're going to play them, um, things like that. So, you know, I know the good thing for um, us is, you know, some of our kids, live in decent areas to where they were able to, you know, be able to use the gyms in their facilities and things like that. Um, and a couple of our guys have actually really been playing basketball um, a lot and, and, and being with their trainers and things like that. So, you know, obviously with us being so young last year, I would have liked to work them out. But the best part about it is, you know, not seeing them in person since February. But when I see them on Zoom calls and they're at the gym or at the court, you know, and they're taking a break to be on a Zoom call, that has always been special um, to know that they've taken it to work out on their own. Um, you know, and that's good for being a young team and losing last year. Um, they're, they're really taking it upon themselves and not repeat what happened last year. Fantastic. Uh, as I mentioned, prior to your 15-year NBA career, my bad on that again, uh, <laughs> you did play at UConn. And I, and I think, you know, one thing – Everyone sees UConn now, multiple national championships, all that stuff. Uh, and doing some reading in the lead up to this, you know, I, I think I knew this, but I'm not positive. But, you know, you were a guy that before that um, extensive NBA career, you were really one of the foundational pieces at UConn, the first McDonald's All-American to commit to the school. I believe you were the first All-American while on campus, single season scoring record. It's not Kemba Walker. It's not Ray Allen. It's Danielle Marshall. Um, you know, I, I guess I would just ask, you know, I mean, it was a different time and it was a different era and everything was so different. Um, and UConn itself was different as a, a burgeoning basketball power. They made the Elite Eight when you were in high school. But what was it that appealed to you about UConn and Coach Calhoun all those years ago? Well, Kemba did break my season, season record um, his last year. He ended up breaking it. Um, he only had that great run in the tournament and stuff like that. It's still a long time, but Kemba had a great – Well, I'll tell you this. The, the web, whatever website I, I read right before I got on the phone, I got to send them an email because I had you at 25 a game your junior year. Is that accurate or was I wrong? Well, oh, well, well no. Yeah, for the I averaged the most points a game as a junior. Yeah, I averaged okay. the most points. 
but he he ended up breaking the singles. Like I think I ended up scoring like eight hundred and fifty five points in a season. I think he ended up scoring like nine nine twenty five or something like that. Um, you know, he ended up making that really good run and um, having you know he played a couple more games in the Big East tournament. Then he obviously won the championship. So um, he ended up getting he ended up breaking his that 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 single season record. But yeah, as far as the the average per uh, game, I, I I have that still. Um, so. Um, yeah, I was confused. I, uh, that was a mix up between us. Yeah, I didn't know what he was talking about on that. But, um, you know, I think that um, for me, what, what attracted me to UConn at that point in time was, um, you know, if you remember that point in time, really, you know, Cliff Robinson was probably the, the name from UConn at that time, especially just playing in the championship, you know, with, against Michael Jordan and all that stuff. And so you really just read about Cliff Robinson. Um, and then UConn had hit, you know, with, with Tate George hitting the shot um, with the pass from Scott Farrell. That was when UConn, like, you know, really got noticed. And then they went for the next year. And it was funny because I grew up watching Syracuse because um, Billy Owens grew up 30 miles away from me. Um, and he was, you know, the, the big star in that area. So I watched Syracuse and on Big Monday all the time. And, you know, being growing up 45 minutes away from Villanova, um, definitely watched the Big East. And I remember getting the letters from UConn and my uncle who passed away um, maybe five, six years ago um, now. Um, you know, he was – I was going to throw the letters from UConn away because I was just <laughs> like, you know, this isn't – this isn't Syracuse. This isn't, you know, Kentucky, Kansas. This isn't any of those schools, you know, that were recruiting me at the time and stuff. And I remember my uncle telling me, like, you know, don't throw that away. Like, you could be the first – everything there you know hmm. you can put that school on the map you can you can do that you know and he's like you know Jim Cowan's a great coach he's like you know trust me and I you know my uncle he you know he, he stayed in my room every night um you know so we always talked about things every time a letter came for me from school or whatever we always talked about it um every night um and you know we, we talked about it and talked about it and, you know, I just stuck with what he said, and I just kept giving it a shot, giving it a shot. And, you know, Calhoun came to my house, um, definitely felt really comfortable with him at that point in time. And then, you know, I think for me, I was always a kid who, as good as I was, I really didn't have a lot of confidence. Um, you know, I, for me, it was like, you know, yeah, I'm 6'9". The league I play in at home, I'm supposed to be doing the things that I'm doing. You know, I'm 6'9". I'm like, you know, what? Everybody else was 6'2", six, 6'3", six, you know, <laughs> this or that, whatever. But then when I went down to Philadelphia and started playing against those people in summer league and still was able to do the same things that I was doing, I started getting more confidence. Um, and for me, I wanted to go to a school that had seniors and upperclassmen that I didn't have to be the man right away my, fre my freshman year. I wanted to kind of learn. Um, and UConn was that school who that, they had that. Um, you know, Maryland had Walt Williams at that point in time, um, but they were on probation already. Um, Syracuse, um, you know, they knew that Billy was my idol at the time and all this and that, and they had him take me on on my visit. But I knew he was leaving for the pros. It was, you know, I knew he, I wasn't going to get a chance to play with him. So, yeah. you know, it really didn't matter at that point in time. And then they were about to go on probation. And, you know, I think with UConn, it was, you know, they had Chris Smith, who was a senior. They had Scott Burrell, who was a junior. Um, they had upperclassmen that were I, I knew I could learn from. And that by the time I was a junior, it was going to be able to be my team. Um, you know, for me, though, Scott Burrell got hurt um, my sophomore year. And it kind of became my team in the middle of the sophomore year. <laughs> um, so it moved a little bit quicker than I thought. Um, and then I got to the play on the USA team um, that summer and was really able to play well. I was the leading scorer, second leading rebounder, and my confidence just went out the roof after that. And, um, you know, but I think with UConn, it was just, I just thought it was the best chance to win, the best chance to become a better player, um, as well as, um, I don't know if you remember back those days, that was before the, the, the practice rules, um, before the, you put the limitations on practice. And okay. I remember they lost to Marathon Oil in the exhibition game, and they had practice the next day while I'm on my visit, and Calhoun practiced them like crazy. I mean, guys <laughs> were throwing up and this and that, and 
I still remember telling my mom, like, I'm not coming here. Like, I'm not practicing like that. I'm not whatever. But my mom actually thought that, you know, she wanted somebody who, when she wasn't going to be around, was still going to be an authoritative figure to me and wasn't going to let me get away with anything. Not that I ever got in trouble or anything, but just she just felt comfortable, like, if something happened, that he was going to be a disciplinarian and this and that, whatever. And, you know, it worked out. It worked out well. Um, You know, obviously, everybody knows Calhoun's coaching style. it works for a lot of us, and, and but I think the guys who were under him and, and succeeded, we all did very well in the NBA as well. So, you know, it worked for us. Real quick, you know, I find something very interesting. I mentioned you're a McDonald's All-American. You saying that you wanted to go somewhere where you can learn from the younger, for the older players, excuse me, and I fast forward that, you know, 25-ish years to now, where it's like, if I can't start right away, if I can't play right away, I'm not going there. Um, I'm not saying one way is right or one way is wrong or one way is this. Or, it's just incredible to me how much things have changed in the sport of basketball. And I guess I will ask you, uh, I'm not saying that if you're an incredibly talented player, you shouldn't uh, you know, have the, the goal to get to the NBA as fast as possible. But do you think now too many guys are too much worried about I got to get in and got to get out as fast as I can rather than learning the game, growing up, maturing, being away from home, all those kind of things? Well, you also have to understand is, I mean, I give you just one little thing when you say that is I came out, I came out of college to the NBA after my junior year. I was the youngest player in the NBA. Wow. Really? And that was my, after my junior year. Wow. You understand is now the youngest players in the NBA are 18, 19 years old. Yep. You know, I had just turned 21 when I announced, I actually announced that I was coming out of school. I waited, I think, three weeks to sign with an agent because you couldn't sign with an agent until you were 21. So oh, wow. you know, I waited. I waited in three weeks to actually sign with an agent because my birthday was three weeks after I announced that I was coming out of school. Um, so, I mean, that's the whole thing is like that, that's the biggest difference here. I mean, I don't know if it's just, you know, that the patience isn't there or whatever. It's just, but I mean, it's also almost 30 years ago. Sure. You know I mean, it, it's, it was times are way different, you know, it is, you know, like I said, I went to school for three years. I was the youngest. Guys now, they want one year or they, they get a chance to go across seas to play. They get a chance to whatever. And the thing about it is even when I was in school, it wasn't like you, you could come out of high school. It was, that rule yeah. wasn't in. You could come out of high school, but it was just people wanted to go to college. They wanted to learn. They wanted to, you know, change their bodies. Like I know me, you know, I was 6'9", 185 pounds coming out of high wow. school. There was no way I, I had a body for – the NBA coming out of high school. You know, even when I left to go to the pros, I was still 6'9", 208. So I still wasn't even, you know, really ready for the NBA physically. Um, but I just think now it's just everybody, you know, uses college for what it is. It's the one and done. And, you know, and, and they try to get to that money maker as quickly as possible. All right, I got to ask, you mentioned uh, being teammates with Scott Burrell. Uh, I won't ask for any um, behind-the-scenes stories, but did you watch the Michael Jordan documentary? Uh, have you talked to Scott about how he was maybe early? Well, I thought he was actually portrayed really well as a guy that Michael Jordan really trusted. I don't know if you still talk to him, if you do, if you don't. But but I just think he Scott Burrell is one of the breakout stars of this quarantine uh, after all the airtime that he got during that Michael Jordan documentary. Well, I mean, one thing you gotta understand is us at UConn, we're actually a we're we're a family, we're a true sure. family. Um, you know, Scott and I talk all the time. The guys we played with, and when I say true family, even guys that we haven't played with, we're all friends. Um, Calhoun made sure of that. Um, you know, even when we, when we were in the NBA, and if we didn't speak to each other and he found out we didn't speak to each other, but trust me, you were getting a phone call that you didn't speak to, you know, you didn't speak to your brother, you know, this and that, and that's the way we are. So, you know, the funny part about that with Scott Burrell is, yes, I called him right away and I, I laughed at him, but I told him, I was like, you're more famous now than when you were when you played, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. um, you know, he laughed, but um, him and Michael are still close and, yeah. and you know, and I think that's the difference is like everybody asked him why, you know, well, I, I would have hit Michael back or I would have whatever and this and that. But like, yeah, people got to understand it. 
as long as Michael didn't put his hands on him, what it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say. And you know, it's like I said, I've been saying, I mean, we played for a fiery coach, you mm-hmm. know, in college, you know, and, and, and some things that were said to us and you know, even my high school coach, some things that were said to us and this and that, like Michael Jordan wasn't saying anything to nobody else on our team that was gonna get us all to to want to fight him or this and that, you know, but what it did was it made Scott a better player too. You know, it made him work harder. And and Scott was a very important part. I mean, I remember when Scott got traded to Golden State, Um, you know, I was, I mean, to, to, to Chicago because he was in Golden State with me and we traded him from Golden State to Chicago. Um, So I remember when all that went down and, um, you know, I think for Scott, it, it was good. You know, it probably helps him out. He's the head coach at Southern. Um, so, you know, it's probably helping them with recruiting right now. You I, know, I would these think kids so. Are seeing him, so, you know, it ended up being really good for him. Absolutely. No, and, and, you know, I tried to reach out to him about an interview request throughout all that, and the school was really nice, but they just said, we're overwhelmed right now. We got so many people calling trying to get a couple minutes of Coach Burrell's time. So, like I said, I think he was one of the breakout stars of this quarantine, and like you said, I think he's more well-known now than he was even when he was playing uh, really quick, you know, you've mentioned a few times Coach Calhoun. Uh, I've had him on this show a number of times, uh, you know, growing up in Connecticut, of course, uh, during that time. I mean, he himself, uh, you know, and certainly as the years went on, got larger than life. One, it sounds like, you know, you still have a great relationship, but what was it like in those days? Because as you said, uh, very demanding, very fiery, and it's why you had success. But, uh, you know, I'd just be curious for your experiences with him, which obviously it worked out pretty well. As you said, you were a lottery pick uh, coming out of your junior high school, uh, junior college, excuse me. Um, for me, it, was, it worked out great. Uh, you know, I was able to get the ball a lot. I was able to score. I was able to, to, to win. Um, but, um, you know, him and I, we had some, some battles. We, we bumped head a couple times. I think some of, we're both Tauruses. So we're both okay. stubborn, uh, you yeah. know, but um, it was never disrespectful or anything like that. It was just, you know, him pushing me. But at the end of the day, too, is like I'm one of them guys who who will laugh, you know, when he yelled at me or whatever. A lot of times I would just I would just laugh or smirk because I just didn't, you know, it didn't bother me. Um, and later on, it was funny because later on in life, I found out, I guess one of the NBA coaches must have asked him, you know, just called him. I was, must have been, he must have just got the job or something like that. And they knew Calhoun. And I guess he must have called him about me and was just like, you know, how is the other person, blah, blah, blah. You know, how do I coach him? What, what do I do? What can I get him to motivate? Whatever. And, you know, Calhoun told me, he told, him, he told the guy this later, you know, later on life. He told me, he said he told the guy, blame him for something he didn't do. <laughs> so I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And he was like, you know, he was like, yeah, he was like, when he was like, I used to always blame you for stuff that wasn't your fault because then you would get mad at me and go out and prove that it wasn't your fault. And next thing you know, you're, you know, he was like, you know, like, for example, if like somebody else was supposed to come over help side defense and block the shot, but he would blame me for, well, you were supposed to be over there, this and that, whatever. And he said, next thing you know, I'm blocking three or four sides in a row because <laughs> I'm pissed off at him trying to prove that I should be over there, whatever. So he told the guy, you know, blame him for something that he didn't do, you know, That's which, so again, I never really caught on to that, you know, while I was playing or this and that, whatever. But, you know, we, we are definitely close. Um, you know, Jeff, you know, Jeff, Jeff yeah. and I were roommates um, in college. So we're basically like brothers. Um, we talk all the time. Um, you know, I, I know the family very well. I, 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 you know, St. Joe's is right around the corner from where I, I live. So I go to practice. The funny part now is though, going to watch the practices now mm-hmm. as a former player. Okay. You know, okay. It's hysterical now. It's hysterical. It, it, it's, it, when you listen to some of the things that Calhoun says to the players now, you're just up there laughing. Cause like, you know, when you're, when you're a player, you don't really process it all you sure. just you, you hear what he says but you're not processing the meanings and things like that but then when you're when you go back as a former player and you're listening to what he says and now you're processing it, especially now me being a coach just processing the things you're saying you're just like this is this is hysterical like it, it, it's funny but um he gets to the players um i mean he built that program in two years i mean they they were what ranked top yep. three in the country i was at the game where they got upset um in the in the tournament um, it was it was a good game, but you can tell that it was one of those 
even though they were ranked number three in the country, you can tell that was an established program of, of players who played together for a couple of years. And I think that was really the difference of that game. So, you know, you mentioned um, going to practice. You know, sometimes when a coach gets older, they, they mellow out. Um, and I could see both sides, him being a little bit mellow. It's a different time. But then I also know that he broke a stool uh, the first game of this season last year. He uh, slammed it on the floor so hard. Is he more mellow now, or is he the same dude from the early <laughs> 90s when, uh, you, when you were in the, 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 the shoes of the now St. Joe's players? Well, he's probably more mellow because he's older, but he's the fire is still there. Like sure. you said, I mean, he hasn't coached in how many years, and he got a technical and broke a chair the very first <laughs> game he coached again. That that that, that doesn't go away, uh, sure. you know. And it's like I said, like why I say it's hysterical because he, he you would have thought that he would be calmer because he's older and this and that. But this the same fire is still there, you know. I mean, he when you if you go to a game, he sits in a high stool. Um, you know, and he sits away from the, the player, the bench a little bit so he can get to a store or whatever. But, you know, he has a water bottle in his hand that, you know, he slams down once in a while when he gets mad. I, I've seen him, you know, do the same thing to the officials, you know, all that. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the fire is definitely still there in him. Um, I don't think that's ever going to go away. But that's also what made him. That's what made him a great coach. That's what made him win three national championships, that fire. And that's what, you know, he instilled in us as players. So. That, that's not going to go away. The only way that's going to go away is when he's not coaching on the sure. sideline. Because, you know, he's definitely is, as much as he is fire around it. When I see him around his grandkids, his grandkids can mellow him out very well. Like, they, they uh, I'm sure officials probably wish they could see what the <laughs> grandchildren could do. Because I've seen it to where the grandchildren have him, you know, in the palm of their hand. And they can make him do anything. So, I think they're the only people who can really mellow him out. Yeah, I talked to him at the beginning of uh, the quarantine, and it was crazy. He was talking about the shows that he's watching, all that stuff. And I had a lot of people reach out and say, I could have never imagined uh, hearing Coach talk about that kind of stuff. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, like you said, he's a little bit different, but you get him between those uh, lines, and it's the exact same thing. Really quick, I mean, obviously with you embarking on a coaching career, I think it'd be dumb for me to ask if, if you haven't taken some things away from him. I know you have. What, have, what, what are the biggest things that you've taken away from watching him all these years, getting to know him both on and off the court? I mean, man, I think on the court I've, I've taken I, – I use the 2 two, one press that he's used that we did. But um, for me, <clears throat> what, I, what I took at is that as great as he coach he is, um, one thing is that I realized even when I was there, but even more when I was going with it, how much he loved us. Um, how much he took care of us, how much he showed us he loved us. Um, and I think that's what I try to um, install in my, in my program and in my, in my team. Um, so let, I let them know how much I love them. Um, I, I've cried in front of my players. I've, I've, I've told my players I love them. Um, you know, some of these players come from, from single, fam, um, single parent homes and some of them don't have father figures, some of them don't whatever. And you know, they all know, um, you know, when, when, if they're going through something at home, they're going through something in life that they can always come talk to me. And they know that, you know, I know a lot of people say, you know, I have an open door policy, but I mean, my players come in my office and joke with me all the time. Um, I keep Skittles and Oreos and stuff in my office and they always come in for snacks and all that. And, you know, they, they definitely know they can come in my office. Now they know when it's serious time, but they know they can come to my office at any time, you know, and ask for something to drink or some, some candy or, some some snacks and things like that. And they'll come in and just watch. You know, if it's late and we're watching TV or NBA game, they'll come in the, in the office and watch the game and ask questions and things like that. So, you know, I think the biggest thing that I took from him is just showing the players how much I care about them. Fantastic. Last couple of questions, I'll let you go. Um, you know, you played uh, for 15 years, as we've discussed, uh, most notably with both the Timberwolves when you were a lottery pick, but you also played – uh, for the 2007 Cleveland Cavaliers, which was the famous team, LeBron 22-23 at the time, uh, helping that organization to the finals. I mean, it, it's surreal to think about back then and LeBron now still, in my opinion, the best player in the league. Um, what, are you, what are your memories of playing with him? Because you, you played for an icon, you played with a couple icons uh, in the NBA, 
and none of them, uh, you know, greater than LeBron, who obviously, like I said, uh, you know, whenever this NBA season gets back started up, uh, him and the Lakers are once again in the driver's seat to potentially compete for another championship. Um, I think the thing that I remember the most was just how much um, history he knew about the game, how much he loved the game at such an early age. Um, you know, you have to understand, I think he's, what, maybe 15 years younger than me or, or whatever. And the fact that he even remembered me doing my 360 dunk, at, in college, you know, and there was a lot of people who don't didn't remember that, you know, at that point in time because they were young, and you know, just he knew the stats of Oscar Robinson, Pistol Pete, you know, guys like that, and then you know he studied the game, and and that's what the kids don't understand today when they when they see how great he is. It's not it's not by accident. I mean, this guy, after games, he watches the games. He goes back and looks and see what his mistakes are. How can he get better? You know, he doesn't just sit back and say, oh, I scored 40 tonight or I had a triple-double. He goes back and looks at his mistakes. He tries to correct on them. Uh, he's a great teacher. Um, he's also a great teammate. Um, and he's somebody that you can depend on. Um, and, 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 and he made things fun. Um, you know, we, we always had great conversation um, when, we, when we were teammates and stuff. And even then we see each other now, we talk, you know, hug and all that stuff. And, um, you know, he's just, he's just a great player. He's a great player, but even if you look at the things that he's doing off the court, he's definitely making a name for himself, you know, with the school that he has, how much he gives back to Akron and Cleveland. But even right now with the Black Lives Matter, um, yep. making sure that he's out in the front, um, making sure people vote, um, speaking about it, uh, speaking about the injustice that the cops are doing and, and things like that. So, you know, he, he's not holding his tongue and, 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 we need more of that. And, um, you know, he's the guy to speak out because he's probably the biggest thing out there. You know, obviously Michael Jordan's whatever, but, you know, with the passing of Kobe, um, LeBron's probably the biggest thing out there right now. And he's definitely doing a great job of, of speaking up um, with, with what's going on in the world right now. Yeah, what I love about it is he finds that balance of, of giving back and being part of the community. And, and he still understands at the end of the day, it's about basketball. And, you know, you, you hear, you know, he finds that balance of, like you said, initiating this uh, cause to get uh, African-American people out to vote in November. But then it's still you hear that he's the one pushing the charge to get everybody back on the court. So I love that he finds that balance and that uh, he still does have this passion for basketball all these years later. Uh, Coach, this was really fun. I, I was going to ask you about that 48-point game. Uh, you know, he scored, I think, 23, 24 in a row in the Eastern Conference Finals. You got any quick memories on that one before I let you go? Well, I tell people that's one of the greatest games I played, and I didn't even score a point. <laughs> 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 you, you know, because if people don't understand the game. Um, you know, the first game of that series – I had – LeBron had passed the ball to me. I had missed the, the, the three in the corner to win the game. And people were all over him. Why did he pass the ball to Danielle? Why did you do this and whatever? You should have took it. You're the superstar. And people always got on him because he made the right play, you know. And, and you know, it was funny because if you, if you read the paper after that, even the Pistons players were like, you know, Danielle just missed it. We, we, we were wrong defensively. He just missed it. We won't leave him open again if they run that play again, this and that, whatever. And the funny part about that play is the next day in practice, we ran the exact same play at the end of the practice, and I made it. Mm. And when I made it, LeBron comes and jumps on top of me like, you know, like <laughs> he had just won the series, this and that, whatever. But going back to the game where you're talking about how many scored in a row, the reason I say that one of the greatest games we played because during that time when he's doing a, a lot of that, they put me in that same corner again. Okay. And they were running that play of variations of that play with me in that same corner because Detroit had said they weren't going to leave oh. me in that corner again. So we kept running that same variation so LeBron could have the lane. Okay. If you look at a lot of that stuff, he was having, he was getting to the lane as much as he wanted to because we, they kept me in the strong side <laughs> corner because the Pistons wouldn't leave me over in that corner. Okay. So I always tell people it's one of the greatest games I played and didn't even score a point because I was the distraction in the corner that led him a lot to getting to the paint and, and getting and, and scoring his points and stuff. So 
you know, it's, some people think you got to always score 30 points or 20 some points to have a great game and be effective. But I think for me, it was, I was effective because I was a good decoy for him because of what happened in game one. And it opened up the floor for him during that time to get those points. So what you're saying is the LeBron game from 2007 is really the Daniel Marshall game. That's what you're trying to tell me right now. No, I'm not trying to tell you that at all. <laughs> no, I, I, no. I, what, what he did was, was something special and something awesome. I'm yeah. just happy that I'm in some of the highlights when they show it. You know, sure. it, you know, I tell my kids I'm out there on the court. You know, this now even 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 when you look at the Last Dance, I was I was excited that I was in five or six scenes in there. Sure. You know, I was like, hey, there I go. You know, this <laughs> yep. and that. You know, even when they showed Scott at UConn, I'm the one who made the pass to him to get the dunk and things like that. So sure. I was just excited that I was in such a great a great documentary. <laughs> Fantastic. Danielle Marshall, the head coach of the Central Connecticut State Blue Devils. Again, if you want to help, uh, program's doing a fundraising drive right now. Uh, the link is on his Twitter feed, at DMarsh42. Coach, this was fun, man. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you taking a few minutes, sharing sharing some really awesome stuff. Genuinely appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Sorry it took almost a year for it to happen, but, <laughs> you know, it ended up being at a great time, you know, so. Yep. Uh, thank you for having me on, and, and thanks for uh, pushing uh, to help our donation. Absolutely.